Okay. So uh, here, uh, this is actually uh, how uh, one can convert innovative ideas into entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial products is always uh, an area of a dilemma. How one has to go through and what kinds of uh, things that happen. And uh, in fact, uh, today we have very good, uh, uh, you know, person uh, expert in this area. Uh, Mr. Nitin Biri, actually, he is going to talk. I will introduce him a little later after I make a brief presentation about this. And uh, this doesn't move. So, but, uh, if, you, this, uh, if you press this, don't move. No. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Now we, no, I press that. Anyway. Now, what uh, uh, is important for us to understand is uh, university is making efforts to move towards. Uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurial activity is much more active. Uh, you know, there is a lot of research going on. And uh, in this, what we notice is that they have tied up with innovation and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, entrepreneurial activities together, both in sciences and uh, uh, even other uh, soft sciences. And uh, in fact, there is a policy now university has on entrepreneurship as uh, in fact, they wanted, it is there in some of the uh, you know, social sciences and uh, uh, humanities, uh, not, not humanities, in uh, management sciences or economics, there are uh, certain courses uh, on entrepreneurship. And, uh, but what is required is a more systematic and more uh, uh, you know, uh, a kind of uh, uh, efforts on the part of the university to uh, build a, a better uh, uh, kind of a ecosystem so that, uh, you know, things become much better. So in uh, 2019, in fact, uh, uh, there is also uh, a, a resolution made in our academic council uh, to promote innovation cell in the university, which they've established quite a few. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I have presented yesterday uh, in the la last uh, presentation, what kind of uh, tide and other things are there, TIU and uh, other uh, uh, incubation centers have also began. So it established also a center for knowledge, culture and innovation studies. And uh, in fact, there is a, a coordinated effort now, there is a separate cell which deals with all research projects and innovation ideas and then converting them into, if there are uh, patents required that will take up and also converting them into commercial and other things, marketing survey, all the things are being done. So the basic objective is to promote innovation among the students and also to showcase their innovative ideas into uh, converting into projects, etc. And uh, now, in this particular uh, this thing, you can admit. In this, uh, anything? Hello. Ah. See, see. Okay. I think we got to do. You got disconnected. Uh, is it connected? Today? No, it's connected. But so, okay. yeah. So is it Wi-Fi? That's fine. Okay. Okay. So what we need is we need to have. That's why the reason is that we discussed about innovation and we discussed about entrepreneurship. But how do we convert uh, innovative ideas into entrepreneurial products? Uh, is uh, the effort that we are making today. Uh, Mr. Nitin Biri is going to talk about that. In fact, uh, how to innovate and how innovation ideas can be converted into entrepreneurial products is an important aspect that we, one need to understand if one wants to become a successful entrepreneur. And uh, in fact, we all know that entrepreneur is one who is also an innovator and who will be willing to take risk to you know, position oneself or carve out a niche for oneself in the field of business 
and uh, uh, also important for us to know entrepreneurs are made they are not born so in this regard our project innotal project has immense potential because it has created a platform called talent co creation lab platform some of you have uh, uh, seen this but basically quickly i will uh, mention this talent co creation lab is a part of innotal project uh, what it helps is it encourages collaborations with external stakeholders for both trainings as well as innovation projects because in this platform one can register and put innovative ideas uh, into that and interested groups can come together whether industry or ngos or faculty students they can come together and design a project and uh, this is actually this lab is a shared space and uh, for both university and students as well as to the external organizations or external stakeholders like the industry ngos government institutions and others we already have uh, you know uh, cii uh, and others uh, government of telangana are part of uh, our uh, efforts we are collaborating on these areas and uh, we have in this lab uh, computers and multimedia and students can participate in all these projects and also trainings together with faculty this is one thing that's wanted to tell and what is it that the uh, tc or the uh, talent co creation lab expects you know you you can uh, issue a call for collaborations with external organizations for example i have an idea i will say i am interested in this anybody else can help me out in that or we can work together a uh, similarly uh, you know uh, all the participant whoever can join i would suggest everybody should join into this and they can those who are participants can uh, take a call and uh, that they are the ideas they can promote them or suggestions or proposals can be worked out on this platform so particularly important is uh, basically live innovation projects which for example companies or industry or ngos or others can uh, say that these are the real uh, you know uh, social problems we have or, or business problems we have or this kind of software these things we require etc etc and uh, for research teams of students they can pose our faculty to solve them so it can be a good platform for uh you know benefiting both sides for external stakeholders also as well as university fraternity but that's faculty or students so trainings are basically in uh, also what we are planning in this under the inotal platform is the trainings are designed and are delivered jointly by the external organizations it is a joint effort and idea is to focus on knowledge and skills that are in demand at present so that one is updated and one can uh, you know be uh, uh, very productive and then it it also enhances employability etc with this i think i will uh, close it thank you very much now now give me a minute please now let me uh, quickly introduce uh, Uh, mr nitin biri uh, is uh, one of the in fact uh, not only he is a social entrepreneur and uh, one of the senior business leaders with uh, you know good track record uh, that he worked with you know uh, very uh, uh, leading organizations in the world uh, and uh, also helped them uh, in multi million dollar Uh, business and uh, he has more than 60 years, 16 years of experience in operational leadership or sales or setup or growth and expansion and also involved in mergers and acquisitions of companies in the united states of america australia and india and is a you know a a, a large set of skills and experience across varied domains and geographies and another important thing is he is a champion of 
uh, human cause is more to help uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, people who really need that kind of uh, uh, support. And uh, he worked in uh, global markets, and uh, uh, but he has. We are lucky that he is back in India, and uh, he is now. Uh, in, in fact, he returned to India in 2016 and started his own entrepreneurial journey. And he started, he co-founded Mate Energies Private Limited with his partner, uh, Mr. Prakash uh, Rochiramani. And, uh, you know, he uh, would have earned crores while working uh, with many others. But then he thought that it is important for us to develop in this country and that is how what he has in fact very interesting kind of innovations which he turned into an entrepreneurial product that is how uh, you know uh, from the plastic waste uh, how to make uh, uh, you know something uh, called H hsd uh, diesel equivalent fuel uh, from end of life of plastic waste this is a very uh, environmental green economy environmental friendly thing and the recycling kind of aspects. Idea was basically to move away from uh, any kind of dependence on fossil fuels and to provide clean and green alternative. This is in thing and uh, now it is uh, one of the important agendas of uh, the UNESCO and others. And uh, uh, idea is that he also has been actively engaged in uh, uh, increasing awareness about hazards of plastic waste or other kinds of things. And uh, uh, he is the right person to talk about with his experience, with uh, illustrations he can explain how ideas can be converted into uh, uh, the uh, products. And now uh, I will uh, uh, leave it to uh, uh, Nathan to take over. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shri Prasad, sir, for your kind words. Really um, thank you, Prabhakar, oh, sir. Ah, um, okay. uh, can, I, can I just one thing? Uh, we can ask quickly, sure, sure. we can ask quickly some of the students to uh, quickly introduce themselves. Sure, sure. Uh, put on your cameras and then uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, Riona, you start with it. Yeah, hello, sir. Brief, brief. Hello, Nikhil, sir. Uh, I'm Riona Sinam. I'm doing my PhD anthropology under Alokshir over here. And uh, thank you, sir. I think I will get more of uh, innovation ideas from today's talk. And I will be loving to see all your work along in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sir. I'm Sai Chiran. Uh, I'm doing my MPhil anthropology. Uh, I have integrated masters from linguistics. Uh, uh, this session, I hope this session makes a lot of insights about the entrepreneurship. Sure, thank you, Sai. Sai Nishant. Good morning, sir. Uh, I cannot uh, switch on my camera, sorry for that. Okay. Uh, myself, Nishant, I have done uh, MA Political Science in University of Hyderabad. Uh, I wish I could get some innovative ideas from this session. Sir. Hi, Ganesh. Sir, so, uh, Ganesh has uh, some issue with mic and uh, camera. He's, he joined the uh, session through personal computer. He don't have a webcam and uh, as well as uh, mic. Okay, okay. No, okay. Anyway, Ganesh is doing his, he's completing his PhD in anthropology. Okay. Um, but actually That's working good. also on archaeological uh, aspects in uh, Andhra Pradesh, if I remember correctly. Some site he's <laughs> excavating there. Yeah. Shyam. Actually, Shyam is working in the similar area. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm Shyam. Hello. Ah, please, Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are able to listen to you. No problem. You just quickly introduce yourself. Shyam. What about other fellows? How do I? Okay, I think uh, I, I, there, there must be some. So I, I think uh, Sham uh, is also doing a PhD in anthropology. 
Okay. Uh, he, he's working on uh, land and uh, coffee plantation, most likely okay. in the Arku area. So okay. Uh, That's very impressive. Yeah, he's um, back. Yeah. 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 Got Sham online. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I got disconnected. Yeah, yeah I got uh, Ganesh's chat as well. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm doing PhD yeah. in the anthropology under Professor Arno. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll uh, so thanks to uh, everybody uh, in the panel for uh, including me in this program. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor for me. Um, I have to tell all of you students, um, you know, this is I'm not a lecturer. I've never given a you know, a talk as well, uh, to unless it is to my peers, especially not to students. And I really didn't know what background you come from. So uh, forgive me if some of the, uh, you know, data that I'm presenting is a little rudimentary. But I thought instead of having a talk or a lecture, I think we should have a conversation. To me, this is a conversation between me and you, where I am bringing whatever uh, I've learned from my experience and, um, you know, watching other people in my domain uh, do uh, as far as startup is concerned, uh, take an idea, grow with it, and stuff like that. I would really appreciate if everybody switches their camera on if that's not a problem, because then we can have a you know a conversation as opposed to I'm, I'm seeing blank screens. If if that's okay, um, because there's also a bit of privacy and other things, but I hope you'll be okay with it. So yeah, uh, like uh, um, I mean, Shiv Prasad sir was very kind and very generous. Uh, uh, with his uh, praise, I am a very uh, ordinary guy who went to Australia, did his master's, went to US, um, who got lucky because I ended up working uh, for three companies. All of them were startups when I joined them, early stages of infancy uh, of startups. And then they grew. The company that I joined in America when I was an SAP guy uh, was a startup and it is an IT services company. And I saw the company grew uh, to a position where then we got uh, sold to a strategic buyer. So I started at the bottom rung because I was just out of the college. And then I uh, grew up the ranks for over about 12 years, 11 to 12 years where I became the CEO. So I, I was lucky enough to handle a lot of um, situations uh, where I had to innovate, uh, strategize, think on my feet. Um, so as opposed to the common misconception that innovation is just you know thinking of an idea once you have the idea or the product or the service, then you just go at it. Uh, in fact, it is iterative. I'll come to all of that. So the way I've structured this, um, uh, like our conversation, our talk, is uh, we are going to discuss about what innovation is about. Um, I'll try and give you, in my mind, uh, you are, and the people I'm speaking to are the innovators of tomorrow, where you will want to have your own startup. So this talk, I'm trying to exp uh, I'm trying to give you the information where you can use this information in the talk and it will help you with uh, starting a company, going to market, stuff like that. Um, so let's, uh, without much mother ado, let's start this. Let me share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, they have to. Yeah, I, I, I lost my. Uh, no, 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 I did it. You did it. Make course. No, I did it I, because I think it, make course. Make course. Make. Question change. Course. Course. Yeah, I I did it at that time, but then. Uh, yeah, I'll do it again. Make course. Yeah. Yes. No, I did it uh, that time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, now, now you can. Oh. So uh, this is, so let's start off with uh, understanding what is innovation, right? So basically it is a process which has a series of steps, right? I mean, um, forgive me, like if this is a little rudimentary, but uh, bear with me and we'll get to the interesting part a little later. But basically innovation is a series of steps that begin with imagination and end with some value to the society, whether in form of a product or a solution. It is taking the invention and taking it to the market through uh, production and at a large scale. That is classic example or uh, definition of innovation. Um, and 
the most important thing about innovation is that it is a very iterative process. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, it is not where you have a brilliant idea um, and you have a product or a service, and then from there on, um, the innovation stops. In fact, it has to be um, very, very iterative, uh, improved upon at every other stage. Just like telephone, right? I mean, you know, maybe in the 19th century, Gramble invented the telephone. And uh, thanks to all the innovations that have happened, now the phone is no longer uh, a means of just making calls. You can actually practically run your whole house and life with it. Apart from the social media, we have controls, in, especially in the US, where you can even control uh, your shopping, your CCTV cameras, your lights, your ACs, pretty much everything, thanks to IOTs. So that is what, in, in, that is what innovation is, uh, the fact that it needs continuous improvement. Um, that is what I wanted to stress. So it brings us to invention, right? Again, a very basic thing. I'm pretty sure we all understand. Uh, invention is something that was never there before. And somebody thought of it. Somebody has come up with it. Just like, you know, you, we, ages back when, you know, we were still hunters and gatherers or just discovered agriculture, we wanted to move stuff. And we were using blocks of wood. Somebody shaved off the edges, came up with the wheel. And now that wheel has transformed its our human has transformed humanity as part of anthro anthropology. You will understand that more than I do. But um, so that's again another example of innovation. What uh, invention can do uh, if it is innovated upon over a period of time. Um, it's also again it's pretty much thing. So um, this is an MP3 player like Carl Heinz. Uh, he invented the MP3 player because remember, I don't know if you, I mean, you guys are too young to know about Walkman, but um, we had those, you know, six songs on a track twice. Um, so we had that Walkman, which now got innovated into MP3 player. But then what did Steve Jobs do, right? He came up with an iPod, uh, the same thing. Now, but this is a very interesting um, picture. You might be worrying about, I mean, you might be wondering what that waffle iron and why the shoe is there. So this was, uh, there was a person called Bill Bowerman, uh, and um, he was a track coach, um, which is basically an athletic coach in the University of Oregon in uh, US. So this was in the um, mid-90s, and um, he was very obsessed with the idea that his, um, his team wasn't doing very well because he thought his, their shoes need to be worked on. And he, you know, designed everything about the shoe, made it aerodynamic and all, but he was not able to crack the soul part of it. And one day he was frustrated early in the morning, his wife served him some waffles and uh, he was looking at the waffle and he realized the design was very, very, uh, I mean, that design kind of gave him an idea. So he poured rubber in the waffle iron, much to, you know, the dismay of his wife. And um, he designed the soul um, and he met a guy called Phil Knight and we have Nike. Right. So that's the story behind Nike being one of the best shoes at that point of time. And I think some athlete won uh, the gold wearing that particular Nike shoe. I forget the name. And Nike, you know, just took over the world. So that's again, uh, it, it's an innovation. Um, just another concept. So this is again is about, it's not about who is an innovator, but what does it take to be an innovator? We all understand who's an innovator, right? But what does it take to be an innovator? So there are a few myths that I'm wanting to bust, right? Um, innovation is not something that you sit in a room, logged up inside and think about it and then write down. So that's an important part of it, but it is a team sport. Uh, it is where multiple people will come with variety of backgrounds and their experiences and they all will get, get on it. And only then a successful innovation actually takes place. It is also, uh, again, uh, it is just about brainstorming. It's not something in your head. It's not an idea that is stuck in your head and then you work from it. It is. It starts with, you know, it's not an idea. What I meant to say is it's not imagination. It's not something that you want to create. Like, you know, in Star Trek, you just want to um, have a spaceship. So that is there. But innovation is where you observe and... Um, you observe you understand what the market what the customer uh, and what the situation your surroundings are from that observations comes 
imagination, right? Comes an idea. It's also not just about being creative. A lot of people might think that innovation is just about somebody who's creative, and I'm not very creative as a person, so I'm maybe not good at uh, maybe not good at innovation. But contrary to that, innovation is a lot about being effective. It has to be an effective problem solving technique more than just being very creative. So we, you know, that brings us to the concept of ideas, right? So let's look at it. So sometimes it, um, you know, easy means difficult. You now I actually thought there will be a lot more students, and I thought I will we'll probably do an exercise. But I just tell you this about. I'll just share this experience of mine with you. So when I started doing uh, amateur theater, and they had made me, uh, you know, do breathing classes, right? And they all they asked me how do I breathe, and they asked me to take a full, you know, fill my lungs up with the air, and I did this. Just like we all do, if I made you do that, you'll probably have your chest jet out because you know we have, our lungs are full of air. But then I realized that if you remember how babies breathe, right? Babies, if you see if you uh, see how they breathe, when they breathe, their stomach goes up, and when they exhale, the stomach goes down. But we, how our chest goes up and chest goes down. So why I'm telling you this? I'm telling you this is because if you, if I make you do that right now, breathe through your diaphragm. It's very easy to understand, but it's very difficult to do because we have worked ourselves out of the practice of breathing the right way. And we have taught ourselves the wrong way of breathing it. So though it's supposed to be very easy, it will get very difficult for us to breathe through our diaphragm as opposed to breathing through our lungs. So why am I talking about easy meets difficult? That's because a lot of people tell us in our lives, think out of the box, think out of the box. And they'll tell you even when you start working elsewhere, or if you are in, um, you know, your partner or any of your comp uh, your competitor or your customer might tell you this, and they'll say, no, it's easy, just think out of the box, but it isn't always very easy. And the classic example of that is we have understood this, right? I mean, six dots without, uh, you know, taking your pen off and without uh, cutting it off, you have to come up with a way of joining all of them. It's only then that we understand that we have to go out of the bond boundaries, percepts, and conceptions that we have. So inside the box, so that's about thinking out of the box, right? It's very, very important for ideas that actually matter. Um, not every great idea is a good idea. Uh, not every idea is a great idea, but there is no innovation without an idea. So why do we need to think out of the box? Because inside the box, if we are very complacent, I mean, if we are very, if we are inside the box, we are very complacent. It doesn't get us anywhere. But be, thinking out of the box, we risk our reputation. So, like again, I mean, thinking out of the box concept, it's not a luxury anymore. It is a necessity. And why do I say that? Because you have all the information, access to all the information that I have, Steve Jobs has, uh, a Mark Zuckerberg has. So, how do we differentiate ourselves? because uh, human dignity depends on, uh, it demands it, that we take this information and we do something up with it that is not being done out there, um, right? I mean, the product that we have, um, I, um, the com my company has, that is an open source technology. But why is that, that there are only few people in this country that are able to do that? That's because we have innovated on the product. So the, the, the need to think out of the box is no longer a luxury, it is necessity. So let's talk about this ideation, right? I mean, um, so how do we go about doing it? So first of all, the idea is, you know, to solve a problem. A good idea is an idea that solves an issue. For example, when um, Richard Branson was stuck at the airport in um, Puerto Rico, right? Um, they, the flights were canceled and he realized that everybody was stranded as was he. He had the money and the resources. He chartered a flight and you know, Virgin was born. We have to listen. Ears are Wi-Fi for ideas, they say. For example, there was there's the lady called uh, Dr. Jean Karathas, and uh, she was injecting um, Botox, uh, an injection, uh, in the eyelids of a patient and who, ha who was having spasms. And that one day she didn't inject it. Uh, he was having spasms all over the face. And that one day he, she didn't inject it in the forehead. And uh, he said, why didn't you do that? 
She said, because your spasms in the forehead have gone. And he said, no, but whenever you did that, I had a very wonderful, beautiful, expression-free forehead. And she listened. So when she listened that, and she realized this is a solution for having wrinkles-free forehead, taking care of the frown lines, and a billion dollar industry was born. So the importance of listening is very, very important with ideation. And observe, we have to be a keen observer. IQ is wins over IQ all the time. Uh, observation is very, very key. And I'll cite you an example. I mean, basically, there's a, the, the lady, Malrin Savant, who's probably had the highest IQ in the history of humanity. She always said, if you want to acquire knowledge, you need to study. But to acquire wisdom, you need to observe. So spot the problem, think of a solution. And every single startup that you have uh, ever known has come from an observation or uh, of observation of a problem, and it has come up as a solution for it. So writing down ideas is a very, very important uh, thing again, when you are ideating. For example, Larry Page, when he was about 23 years old, at about 2.30 in the night, he got up from his sleep and he, uh, he was just thinking, how, what if I can, you know, download all the web and just have links for it? And then he got up and he wrote it down. And the next few years, he worked with Sir Guy Brin and we have Google. Had he not written it down in the middle of uh, the night when he got an idea in his dream, or maybe in his um, um, you know, subconscious state, um, he probably wouldn't be able to execute on it. So writing down ideas is very, very important. So when you worry, when you think about idea, all of these issues, uh, all of these four or five points are very, very important. And the last important point, which I would like to talk about is about being brave. Now, what do I mean by being, being brave? So we have this misconception or a myth saying that, you know, I and mean, we do it to ourselves all the time, that maybe I'm not smart enough, I'm not uh, intelligent enough, I'm not creative enough. And why did I get this idea? Why hasn't already somebody thought of it? You know, I mean, it's not as if I'm the smartest person on the planet, somebody must have thought of it. So I will not go ahead with it. Maybe, you know, it's not good enough. In my mind, it sounds good, but I'll not go ahead with it. And um, personally, if I want to tell you a small example, uh, when I started this company, and I'll explain to you the product that we make, but when I started this company, I was at a crossroads. I was not able to get any client at all. I couldn't entice or uh, explain any client that this product was really, really good. And so I thought of going to the uh, OEMs, the original uh, equipment manufacturers. One of them was Thermax. And I wrote a very, um, you know, a very... Uh, I wrote a letter in a lot of frustration to the head of research there, uh, Dr. Mr. Sonde uh, from IIT chemistry department. And then he connected me to um, the chairman. I got lucky there, uh, Meher Padamzi. And um, she asked me to fly down. She flew me down to Pune. I was supposed to meet her for 15 minutes post lunch, but then we spent four hours till evening. And we had tea and we had lunch together. And then I had told her that I'm very scared sometimes. I have dark days and nights and maybe this product is not good enough. And then uh, she, you know, I remember she sat me down and she said, don't do that to yourself. Believe in yourself. And she told me, you know, have the courage, be brave. And uh, she gave me, she did something that I was not expecting. She gave me a letter saying that I, my fuel can be used in all her installations. And that letter got me my first client. So sometimes uh, we, I can resonate with people who have those dark days and uh, self-doubt, but we have to remain brave. So that's the most important part of, you know, taking an idea, taking an innovative idea and into uh, making it a product. So idea validation, right? What is that validation? So you have an idea, you get proper feedback from it, you go to the market. This is a very small thing I just wanted to bring up. Uh, the survey is very, very important. It's mostly underplayed. You go ask your family and people who are already you know, associated with you, which I think is a very bad concept. You should probably go to the competitors in the market, the customers, the market itself, and ask and find out if your idea is really, really uh, worth it. And what I mean by saying that is, uh, there are some problems that probably don't need uh, a solution. So you need to ask whether it, your problem is big enough, right? I mean, I'll give you another personal example. Uh, a, a very close friend of mine had this brilliant idea. Um, he was working for a very well-established company, uh, one of the fan companies. 
and he wanted to break out you know in the his, he just wanted to come out and start because he wanted he, he thought i everybody is giving you know having a startup i need to have a startup and um, his idea was he wanted to make my trip was already there but he said see they don't cater to a particular niche and the niche i want to cater to is all the people who are going on pilgrimages right um, if somebody wants to go to Tirupati or somebody from South, if, you, if they want to go to Uttarakhand, they have nobody there. From South, if they want to go to Tirupati, they generally will have somebody in the neighborhood or in the family to find information about how to get there, what to do, all of that. But if you want to go to Uttarakhand or somewhere in Northeast, they have no idea. They're completely dependent on, uh, you know, uh, just travel brokers. And then he said, you know, he came up with this platform, a concept, an ideation. He, he had done a lot of research and he showed it to me. And I thought it was a great idea. But then we actually, when we took it to the market, you know, for survey, and when we looked at the data, uh, we didn't think um, that the problem was big enough that people would latch on to the solution. So the idea was good. It solved the problem. But this problem was not big enough for this idea to become a very successful project because people still found different ways of going to Vaishnav Devi, for example, right? Or other places in Uttarakhand. I myself ended up going to a place called Neem Karori. Um, this is again, a very funny incident. Uh, initial days of my startup, uh, the first year when we didn't have much of sales, I had read somewhere that Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg ended, uh, actually Steve Jobs had gone to Neem Karori, Baba in the 1970s. And um, he got a brilliant idea there. And when Mark Zuckerberg uh, came up with Facebook, uh, and he was started, he started to get um, you know big famous, and the company was becoming bigger. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg reached out to Steve Jobs, and he said, "You should go to India, go there." And so me and a couple of other entrepreneurs, we all thought we should go and have a boys trip or an entrepreneurs trip, and see what is that place where all, you know all these. Google COO uh, went uh, and stayed there for two months. So what was happening there? So I had no idea what it was, but Google solved my problem, right? Uh, make my trip solve my problem. I, I got flights from here to Delhi. Uh, I called somebody, found a travel agent. Uh, he, we booked an Innova from Delhi. We drove down and uh, we were there. So this app, he, if he had invested a lot of resources and time, uh, would never take off because yeah, it would be convenient, but Google was already doing it. So again, um, you know, and, and yeah, the trip was worth it, right? I mean, we, I got, uh, it's a personal experience. So it was definitely worth it. Now I understand what Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg got from there. Um, but um, besides the point, so we have to, it's very, very important when it comes to idea to understand whether we are solving a bigger problem or it is just some inconvenience that people will, you know, figure a way out. Now, the most important thing, if you want to be an entrepreneur tomorrow, right, an innovator turned entrepreneur, is a team. You have to have a team with you. And basically, you have to network. I mean, networking, networking, networking. Like in real estate, they say everything is about location, location, location. In, uh, in, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, in startups, it's all about networking. You need to make associations. You have to be part of charters. You have to have, um, you know, a very, very good lay of land as far as your competitors are concerned. You have to know your customer market very well. Who's your customer? What is their uh, spend levels? Are there SMEs or are there big levels? What are you catering to? Who are you catering to and why they should buy it? This is very, very important for you to be, be able to build the right team. You might have some very intelligent people who are completely, um, you know, unaware of what the market is like. And that's why a lot of very competent people fail as CEOs of very big companies. Uh, like Mark Sully failed uh, as the CEO of Apple, though he was the CEO of Pepsi. A different industry, different niche. So we have to be very, very sure who we are hiring. And I always believe in hiring counterparts. If you are naturally a technical guy, right? If you are good at coding, you should probably hire somebody who's good at sales marketing, making connections, right? Somebody who is very good at finance, somebody who understands m and And you, I mean, basically in building the team, I'll come to that uh, in the next, uh, 
yeah, I'll come to that a little later. But basically, find a counterpart, right? I mean, if you are good at sales, then you need somebody who's good at, um, you know, technical aspect. Just like Steve Jobs again. I'm taking the most uh, famous examples because then I don't have to explain the backstory. But you know, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs never quoted a line in his life, but he understood the product so well that he became the innovator. But Steve Jobs was the guy who actually did all the hard work behind uh, Steve Wozniak. So it was very smart of Steve Jobs to partner with Steve Wozniak. Otherwise, he wouldn't be what he is today. In fact, they wouldn't be Apple. And if Steve Wozniak had his way, uh, Apple would probably still be in some store somewhere in US and not the global company we know of. So we need to find doers. There are a lot of people you will meet on your journey to being a successful entrepreneur uh, who are thinkers. You know, great, very, very talented people who are ready to sit back, play devil's advocate, uh, tell you how things to be done. They've read everything. They've read all the books, um, very, very motivational self-learning books and all of that. But you don't need them because you need a doer. You need to you need to find people in your team who can hit the road and start working. Thinking will get you nowhere or beyond a point. And also uh, some, find somebody who has a passion. If you are, if your team is consisting of primarily it's a core team, when you start off, you probably just have only the core team because you can't afford to have a big team. You don't have the money to pay them. So the people, the three or four people that you have, they need to be driven by passion uh, because passion almost always guarantees hard work. Now, I mean, let me rephrase that. Passion guarantees hard work. Right. And hard work almost always guarantees success with a bit of luck thrown in. We can never undermine the importance of luck. But without hard work, without passion, nobody's ever going to work that hard for that many years. And the reason I'm telling this, I'm sorry, I don't have I, I didn't want to clutter the whole uh, PDF, but I'll give you an example of Book My Show. Book My Show was started by one person, Ashish Hemranjani. When uh, he got drunk under a, uh, he, he got drunk in a music festival in South uh, South Africa, and he woke up under a tree. That's why it's, his company's name is called um, the Big Tree, right? So he found himself under a big tree, uh, drunk, hungover, and he was listening to a radio. And in that show, radio show, they were selling tickets to a music festival. And then it occurred to him, why can't we do that in India? This was 1997, maybe. And we didn't even have internet back then, right? So he came and he partnered with two other people. Um, I'm not sure whether they were IIT IMs or just IIT, but both of them, both of the other two people were his friends. All three of them were very passionate. They started the company against all odds and they closed the company down two times. Twice they had to close the company down. Once they didn't even have enough money. So they had about, I think about 200 employees and they didn't have money for uh, rents and salaries the next month. And so they, Ashish goes ahead, calls everybody in the park in Bombay and says, I'm sorry. And they, all three of them went, closed the company down pretty much, went back and started doing jobs. Just then again, Ashish said, no, I have to give it everything. He had a house. He sold it for 60 lakh rupees. Everybody else pitched in, left their job, came back again the third time and started book my show. This time around, they were right. The time was right. Internet was there. DSLs had gone out. We had Wi-Fis. They, I mean, at least it was coming around. People were open to the idea of booking tickets online. They started calling people and giving them the option of booking tickets to movie theaters over the phone because mobile phones were in. Uh, it was no longer eight rupees per call per minute. And so environment was changing, but their persistence kept at it, you know, the buses has gathered. But why Why I'm bringing that up is because the, that, that part of the timing changing is the luck. But if they didn't have the passion, he wouldn't sell his only house. And it was only, it was just not him, the other two people as well. So the three people actually are worth in thousands of pros today. And they were passionate. So that is very, very important. And the most important thing, for me, in my experience of over 16 years, is talent. Um, talent is very, very important. Talent is not as important in sport, maybe, where aptitude and uh, you know, work ethic is far more important. But in entrepreneurship, you have to find the right talent. 
it is very very difficult to find talent and it is even more difficult to uh, to uh, you know to retain talent so if you are an entrepreneur if you want to have a uh, if you have a dream of being an entrepreneur the biggest lesson i would uh, you know the biggest takeaway that you should probably have is the importance of spotting talent and figuring out how to retain them that talent will help, help you uh, you know turn the company around again um and prototyping is very very important if it's a product based company um you you have to test it and a lot of people will say you know prototyping is overheard but see that's the best place you can fail right and a lot of people will say prototyping is very very expensive but that is part of the investment it is not a waste of money it is going to save you a whole lot of nightmare and headache in the future <laughs> for example google glass right i mean uh, google came up with uh, google glasses it was an uh, augmented reality concept and they thought they were very inspired they were very kicked about it right uh, especially from they were inspired by john f kennedy long back talking about how we need to break boundaries and you know invest in space um, race right you know and that's when nasa was given a lot of funds so i think sergey bring was very very fascinated with it and he said no we need glasses that breaks all bonds we just don't need glasses to see let's have augmented reality in it and what they did was they gave it to i think san francisco uh, to quite a bit a, a bigger pool of uh, people in uh, sf and uh, what they realized was the hype around the glasses was far more than the usability and the acceptance by the people and because of which they stopped they never went ahead with google glasses it was a great it was a very very cool concept and there is there is a lot of other controversy around that but primarily they just realized that people were not ready for it now had they just gone with the hype that google glasses had created because anything coming out of apple or fine like google will have a huge hype in the media and uh, people but had they not done the prototyping and testing in real life they would have lost a lot more money and more importantly face because the product was good they thought it was a very futuristic product but it didn't appeal to the people at that point of time so it's very very important that you test your concept whether it is product or whether it is a service in a prototype situation just like swiggy did right um swiggy we all understand um, i i keep forgetting the name so nandan reddy sri harsha and rahul right basically nandan reddy and sri harsha they thought of this concept i'll not go into the back story we all understand swiggy story but again they only started with one kormangla one neighborhood it was started in one neighborhood with six executives delivery executives and 25 restaurants that is all they did they did not put all their money in they didn't get too excited about the concept they just said will this work let's start with six delivery guys and 25 restaurants and they did oh yeah also but i'll come to a very interesting thing right called upa so there is this, there are two guys right garrett camp and uh, we all know travis kalanick so Ga uh, camp and travis were in paris in 2008 and they were coming out from i don't know where they probably drunk <laughs> at 3 in the night and they didn't uh, we were not able to find cabs and then they and i think camp said why can't we uh, you know order cab just like we can order something sales and they said okay let's think about it now both had just sold their companies for i think 39 million and 75 million so they had the money for it but a year goes by cam comes back to us and he's just sitting one night and he thinks let's do this okay let me put some money in and he registered a company called urban cab oh, sorry uber cab it started off as a time share limousine service it was not even a cab but he uh, registered the domain uber cab Uh, hired uh, three cabs in only new york ran it for uh, i think 6 weeks then took it to uh, la and uh, california somewhere in california uh, san francisco again i guess uh, because everything is happens in silicon valley and around that area but he took it there tested it for another 3 months before uber actually came into place so it started as a uber cab which was a limousine time share because you know you can't limousine is a very expensive service you have it for only one or two hours and in one night there are about seven or eight people who want to have limousine so he start we let so he thought why not do that so uber actually started as a timeshare uh, limousine service so it's very very important 
whether it is a service or a product, we do the testing in a prototype situation. And again, iteration, right? The most important thing before you bring the product on is iteration. Now, why do we have that iPhone there? It's because the original iPhone, I'm sorry I couldn't get the picture, um, but the original iPhone looked horrible. It had everything because Steve Jobs didn't want buttons on his phone, right? He wanted to do what um, uh, you know every other phone could not. He said, I don't want any buttons on it. And he kept at it. And finally, he had to relent when they said, we have to have at least have a home button, which in 2020, they finally get, got rid of in um, iPhone, uh, the latest version of it. There's no home button. But he said, he relent, he finally said, okay, to one home button. Look at the picture. I mean, look at the simplicity of it. And that is that happens only when it was stuck in the lab for about two years before it came out. So iteration and testing and iteration and testing is key before you bring your product out. And uh, this is again coming, I'll spend only about five minutes on this. What kind of an organization you should have if you are a, if you want to be an entrepreneur, right? Um, you need to figure this out. Uh, you need a lot of legal and uh, professional uh, advice. So I'll just touch base on it. There are different kinds of uh, organization structures, sole pro uh, proprietorship, LLP, private limited companies, nonprofit, stuff like that, right? You need to check your liabilities. Uh, if things don't work, how liable will you be? What are the, what is the better structure as far as uh, raising funds in future is concerned? What compliances are you required to maintain? You don't want to be bogged down with a lot of fees and costs and paperwork. You need to keep it very simple. So for example, in my, my case, we started with a sole proprietorship because we just had a factory. And then now we are a private limited company because we uh, wanted to go and raise funds. So you can always move uh, move about, but again, that's a professional advice you will need to take. Now, I I'll, I'll, I want to just quickly touch base on what fundraising is all about. I'm sure a lot of people might have some questions about fundraising. So this is a very high level um, topic. I'm, I mean, this is a very high level approach to it. So let's understand fundraising, right? I mean, people who are going to invest in your company. So they are taught roughly about six or seven different categories of people, venture capitalists. Who are they? They're professional money managers. Um, they will uh, plan to exit your company in five or eight years, eight years max. Uh, it's very difficult to convince them, but they will bring a lot of money in it, right? I mean, they can actually pretty much fund your whole round. So generally in funding, what happens is you have your seed capital and then you have series A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. So one particular round can be funded by venture capitalists that are that big. Again, they will help you with sales and networking. Um, some of the major ones are Secure Capital, Axel Partners, Helion. Examples of uh, companies are just style, snap deal, make my trip. They all went through venture capitalists. Then there are angel investors. Angel investors are basically heavy net worth individuals. They always kind of mostly work in groups. They are smaller in terms of funding you. Um, anywhere between 100K to about a billion or two. This is all US dollars. They'll help you with networking and sales, you know, help you with develop revenues and stuff like that. Some of the famous ones are, uh, you know, Ranjan and then Anupam uh, Mittal, Ratan Tata, uh, Vijay Shekhar from Paytm, and, you know, DriveZ, Instamojo, Ola, they all went through, you know, angel power investors initially. Now, there's a lot of confusion between accelerators and incubators. So I thought I'll include them as well. Accelerators are basically, you know, they programs that are run for about three or 12 months. They'll come in, help you accelerate your startup. They'll probably put in maximum up to about $100,000, which is 70, 70 lakh rupees. Um, they'll help you with the space, office space. They'll get you mentoring, uh, help you connect with all the legal advisors, investors, help you raise funds, prepare for the first round as well. And they will ask a part of equity, generally not more than 10%. Uh, one of the famous ones is Y Combinator, uh, Airbnb, Dropbox, Reddit, they all went through accelerator programs. Now, the same thing is with incubators. Incubators basically are similar to accelerators, except for the fact that they are even shorter. You know, they will not maybe a year or two. Um, they don't ask any equity at all. They won't give you any funding. They'll help you with mentoring stuff. 
um, with, with mentoring and networking and other accelerating growth tools. Again, they'll give you office space and all that. So initially, if you just have an idea product ready to go and you have nothing at all, an incubator is right for you because they don't ask you for any equity. They generally run on government grants and corporate sponsorship. T-Hub is a very, very famous incubator we all know about. Strategic investors are those companies that, you know, are big in your own space. Like um, Microsoft bought Hotmail out. Uh, they'll just probably buy you out or they invest heavily in it. Uh, they because they what you are providing the product is an add-on to them, right? You're providing the product is either an add-on to their product or it helps their products in some other way. They're strategic. Strategy is basically they come from the same industry that you are catering to. Um, then the last thing is crowdfunding. It's very it's not ideal. It's very rare. It happens. We have uh, a lot of good crowdfunders, Milab, Keto, Wishberry, and stuff. And there are some, uh, none of the big names are from crowdfunding, but that is also a way of looking at it. Generally, um, you know, making a movie or getting some basic smaller apps out is done through crowdfunding when none of the other traditional investors are there. Um, the, there's a very unique way to look at it, uh, which is called pre-sales, right? I mean, if you have a specific product for a specific customer or an industry segment, um, you probably entice the customer to, you know, pay you before the product is delivered. And that has happened. That's happened quite a few times. And so you don't need any initial seed funding at all. Um, you know, this is project-based work initially and customers will then, uh, and so basically if you go through this route, what happens is there's a bit of market validation for you for the future funding. So basically these are the kind of uh, fundraisers or um, investors that you will be looking at. So what do we do once we are in the market, right? When your product comes to the market, what happens then? So you have to prioritize your time and your resources. I'll explain to you how. So this is called super poly diesel. This is when I wanted to bring and talk about my product. Otherwise it'll just be a small course on innovation. So I'll switch screens. So is it okay if I run a, a small two minute video? Okay. Give me one second. Yeah, take them, no problem. Uh, it's uh, downloading a plugin to share a video file. Give me one second. Are you able to see this, sir? Are you able to see this, sir? You can see. Yeah. Uh, what about others? Uh, friends on the uh, group, I, can you see? Yeah, sir. Yeah? yeah. So this is, a, I, I wanted to explain to you about the product, right? So I want you to first understand, I thought it is better uh, if you would understand what happens to plastic 
um, and why is plastic a menace? So that's the reason this video is there. It's a short video. Please bear this with is me. the story of three plastic bottles, empty and discarded. Their journeys are about to diverge with outcomes that impact nothing less than the fate of the planet. But they weren't always this way. To understand where these bottles end up, we must first explore their origins. The heroes of our story were conceived in this oil refinery. The plastic in their bodies was formed by chemically bonding oil and gas molecules together to make monomers. In turn, these monomers were bonded into long polymer chains to make plastic in the form of millions of pellets. Those were melted at manufacturing plants and reformed in molds to create the resilient material that makes up the triplets' bodies. Machines filled the bottles with sweet, bubbly liquid, and they were then wrapped, shipped, bought, opened, consumed, and unceremoniously discarded. And now here they lie, poised at the edge of the unknown. Bottle one, like hundreds of millions of tons of his plastic brethren, ends up in a landfill. This huge dump expands each day as more trash comes in and continues to take up space. As plastics sit there being compressed amongst layers of other junk, rainwater flows through the waste and absorbs the water-soluble compounds it contains, and some of those are highly toxic. Together, they create a harmful stew called leachate, which can move into groundwater, soil, and streams, poisoning ecosystems and harming wildlife. It can take bottle one an agonizing 1,000 years to decompose. Bottle 2's journey is stranger, but unfortunately no happier. He floats on a trickle that reaches a stream, a stream that flows into a river, and a river that reaches the ocean. After months lost at sea, he's slowly drawn into a massive vortex where trash accumulates, a place known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean's currents have trapped millions of pieces of plastic debris. This is one of five plastic-filled gyres in the world's seas, places where the pollutants turn the water into a cloudy plastic soup. Some animals, like seabirds, get entangled in the mess. They, and others, mistake the brightly colored plastic bits for food. Plastic makes them feel full when they're not, so they starve to death and pass the toxins from the plastic up the food chain. For example, it's eaten by lanternfish. The lanternfish are eaten by squid. The squid are eaten by tuna. And the tuna are eaten by us. And most plastics don't biodegrade, which means they're destined to break down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics, which might rotate in the sea eternally. But bottle three. Nidhan bhai, it is khani to khatam nahi hui. Nee, khani mein isliye rok diya because uh, it, it talks about the recycling part of it. Okay, the okay. third bottle gets recycled. Okay. Yeah, so that's so you come in. yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, that's when we come in, right? So uh, plastic. Uh, so I'm going to deviate from the innovation part and concentrate only on the product. Uh, no, this is about the product itself. It's not about our journey and all that stuff. So please bear with me. Um, very bad at PPTs and all, <laughs> so somebody else does it for me generally. But uh, this is um, M weight energies, right? Motivate energies is what for some numerological purpose we had to make it uh, M weight. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it gets the job done. So what we we are is a waste to fuel energy, right? We have uh, alternate energy oil company. Uh, it feels nice to say oil company, but what we do is we take plastic. So what we saw in that video was those two bottles, they either, and in India, there's a third concept where we also burn rubber and plastic. So it's also in the air now. So plastic by nature is plastic by nature is something that cannot be recycled continuously. There is something called end of life plastic. So plastic comes to a place stage where it cannot be recycled, which is when you have, let's say for example, a bottle, right? A bottle like this, 
can be recycled into maybe um, a trash bucket, right? And this trash bucket will be recycled into something more cruder. You know how we have to scoop up all the dust, um, you know, with a jhadu in our house. That is the, one of the most very crude materials. But after that, what happens? You can't get any worse from that. I mean, it's very thick, uh, not malleable plastic. So from there, uh, it comes to a stage where it cannot, uh, it's a you know, end of life plastic. So that is what is, I'll not go into statistics, but this is pretty bad. I mean, we are already there. We are already damaging the uh, environment. And some people say that it's irreversible now. But not to be pessimistic about it, um, what we try and do is, so what do we do about it? So basically the idea is plastics, you know, basic uh, chemistry 101, it's hydrocarbon. It comes from oil, it goes back into oil. It can go back into oil. So that's the idea, right? You know, this is the hazard, one, two, three, four, five. You make plastic from fuel, it gets disposed, you collect it, it's recycle it. When it can't be recycled, you get fuel back. That's the whole idea of this. So what is this technology? It's, we call it thermal cracking. Some people call it pyrolysis. There are different terminologies to it. There are differences in each of the tech technologies. The one we use is called thermal cracking. To give you a very brief idea, we take all the plastic here. The, now this end of life plastic um, is either turned into powder or small granules. I have seen shown here granules of actual, this is a picture of actual granules that we use. Um, if I can, can you see my mouse pointer, sir? No, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes, we yeah. are. So basically there are seven types of plastics, right? LDP, uh, you know, PET plastic, HDP, LDP, PVC, PPS, and others. So out of these, we can't use PET, for example, because it's got a lot more oxygen in it and uh, extracting it, it gets very expensive. PVC, again, chlorine factor is very high. We don't. And so basically we use PP, PS, and a variety of a few other plastics. Uh, and so what happens is this plastic, this end-of-life plastic, from all sources is collected, granulized, put into a chamber, which we call a reactor. This, this happens uh, and it is actually heated in the absence of oxygen. So all the gases are collected and then they are condensed, we get oil from it. What we also get from it is something called a syngas. It's about 20%. So the oil is about 75 to 80%. Uh, optimal is 80, supposed to be 84, 85. It's very difficult to get it consistently. About 75 to 80 percent um, every in every batch. The remaining about 15 to 20 percent is syngas. We collect it in a big balloon, store it, that gas, and the, and we have a gas generator. So that gas actually powers the whole plant. And we also get about four or five uh, percent of carbon black. This is the tar that is remained in this uh, around the walls of the reactor. So this is extracted and this is used in dyes, road manufacturing. I mean, people who are laying the roads, paint manufacturing companies. We don't, it's not a source of revenue as such, but it takes and keeps us clean. You know, we get enough money to transport it and dump it uh, where it can be used. So that is actually the kind of plast, uh, fuel we get, uh, you know, where it says waste plastic. Um, that is the color of uh, fuel that we get. So it's as good as diesel. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, a comparison of diesel versus uh, super quality diesel fuel in terms of the technical parameters, right? I mean, basically, calorific value is, uh, for all simple purposes, can it burn as well as uh, diesel? Yes, it can. In fact, it is a little higher sometimes. And all the other, I will not go into the technical aspects of it, but where it actually stands out, why is it even better than diesel is because of its sulfur content. Basically, plastic has very little sulfur content compared to crude oil. So your SOX and NOX emissions, NOX is pretty much the same, but the SOX emissions are almost negligible, which is a huge plus for uh, companies like cement industries and other industries where they use diesel for manufacturing process, where they have to worry about curtailing or putting a ceiling on their uh, emission uh, rates. So it's a huge plus. That's why this fuel is, uh, you know, uh, very easily welcomed in such uh, sectors. So this is again talking about 
you know, why they should go for it. And they get, they get carbon credits and all that stuff. Um, so uh, this is going to end here. I just wanted to have, uh, give you a, you know, a quick uh, look at what we do and what the, what is the product we are looking at. So I'll go back to where I came from. Um, so once you're in the market, right? So now we all understand what the product is, right? I mean, we take end of life plastic, make fuel out of it. This particular fuel is as good as diesel. It is way cheaper than diesel. So it's a financial aspect. The other thing is uh, it has less socks. So therefore uh, emission rates are less. Second, so for example, just to give you, this is again, I'm not right on the math, but, and though we don't use these bottles, right? I'll give you an example of this. Let's say bislery bottles. If you take 20 million bislery bottles, you will approximately get 15 million liters of, um, you know, uh, or 1.5 million liters of uh, diesel. So 1.5 million liters of diesel is saved because you have converted this plastic into that fuel. It's a huge plus, right? I mean, you're not only just consuming plastic, which is going to end up in a landfill or in the ocean, but you're also not consuming a fossil fuel. So you're getting carbon negative, so to speak, uh, theoretically, though it is not carbon negative necessarily, but you're not utilizing fossil fuel at the same time you're solving a bigger problem. So when it comes to solve problem solving thing, we I didn't want to take my product example every for everything, but even with prototyping, we did uh, prototyping a lot. We would sell, ideally now we sell uh, our fuel in tankers of 10,000 or 12,000 liters or 20,000 liters. But for the first year, we sold at 200 liters also to shop, small shops where they use diesel, right? This diesel is not uh, ideal for your IC engines, your cars and bikes, but it is uh, very, very ideal for heating purposes in the industrial sector. So even in Katedan and in um, our industrial areas in Hyderabad, we approached shops and said, you know what? If diesel was about 60 rupees then, we said, we'll give it to you for less than half. Just try it out. Tell me what problems you have. And for uh, almost a year, we kept working at it. it. It had a host of problems, right? So we had to come up. I spoke to a lot of people in uh, professors. I, I shouldn't say people. Professors in South America and in UK. And they gave me some information. There are some uh, professors in India. Uh, there are institutes in India um, where they helped us, you know, tweak the product a bit. Um, I, we could do some, we couldn't do some because of finance, uh, but we have an understanding of where the product is going wrong. And so we have now curtailed the use of the product to a particular segment. We are not going crazy about it. We are not promising heaven and earth to everybody, right? Uh, so we know where our product is because of the limitations. And uh, we, I always keep telling people that we are not limited by technology, we are limited by commerce. So if diesel becomes 300 rupees per liter, we'll be the happiest people because I can do a lot of R&D and then you know sell it for 150 rupees and everybody will have a fuel. But that's not going to happen. So that is our reality. So we are doing, uh, you know, we are doing what we can do best. So what am I talking about once the product is in the market? Um, we are talking about prioritizing time and resources, right? When we started off, we our only work was, you know, working on the product. I didn't want to be drained by all the other activities, right? So me and my, um, again, uh, having a team, building a team is very important. So I'll touch base on that as well. Uh, my co-founder was, um, you know, taking care of the production aspect of it. The technical aspect was already done. We both had invested our time. Uh, that was done. Now the production was happening. Now, maximizing the production, optimizing the production cycles, taking care of the labor, all of that is one aspect. Sales and strategy was another aspect. So we both considered only these two aspects. We outsourced pretty much everything else there was because for a startup, you have to be very lean. And when I say lean, what I mean is you cannot afford to have a lot of operating expenses. OPEX is what they call it because you have put a lot of money already in your CapEx, your capital expenditure. Right, or whether you've raised it or it's your own money, seed capital, whatever it is, you would want to be lean because you, that will give you 
that much more time to survive in the market. So all our legal was outsourced. Uh, we got a CA, right? And we got an employee in the CA office and we told him with the permission of the main CA, can you do this work on weekends for us, right? Bookkeeping, doing our payroll, keeping up with all the other compliances that as a company we were required to do. Earlier we were a sole proprietorship, but then we became a private limited company. So we have a lot of paperwork that I don't have an understanding of, that I have lived away for 16 years. So I understand the, uh, the, you know, the US uh, paperwork better than India. And my, my, my partner was also not very conversant with uh, running a lot of paperwork. We are not required to be. So we have to outsource. You, uh, I, I would highly recommend that you concentrate your uh, key resources and your time and your energy in taking the product, making it better, and taking the product and taking it to the market. Everything else you should outsource. So that is what I was talking about by... Uh, saying when I when I said prioritize your time and resources. Now scalability, it's a very very important pro, uh, concept, which you, we should obviously have would have thought of at the ideation stage itself. But once we are in the market, what are we going to do about it? Right? We are we will be faced with situations where we are required to upscale immediately. Right? That is what has happened. That is what actually happened to us. Um, we first year was very dismal for us, right? I mean, we had nothing. Uh, we had only one client and we had phone, sold only 20,000 liters, which is basically one month's production. The production was stalled. We were just sitting around. Um, we were just trying. But then as the time went by, and after I told you about the Thermax letter and a few other things, we became partners with CII, with the technology partners. They got us railways. And then... I, be, I put a lot of strategy in, turned it around. We went to Virgin uh, Industries, Jindal came in, a lot of other companies came in and suddenly we saw ourselves having huge sales orders and our production could not go up because we didn't have the time. We didn't plan ahead for such a huge uh, sale to hit us. And this is a factory, this is a manufacturing product. It's not an IT product where you, know, you can just scale it up by hiring more people. From conception to build, it is an 18 months project. So I can't say no to people I just have solicited uh, saying, no, no, I'll give you the fuel, but wait for two years, right? And then go start looking for employees. Uh, go, go start looking for investors to give me that uh, money to put up two new, two new factories or three new factories. Because one factory was one unit. I shouldn't say factory. One unit was producing 20,000 liters. And we at one point of time had 100,000 uh, in per month sale, orders, okay? So what do we do? And the time that we were in, we had connected ourselves with other suppliers. Now, everybody has other issues, right? Somebody was very good at production. They had optimized it, but they couldn't do the sales. Somebody uh, was very good with the labor. So the production cycles were good, but then they, they couldn't go out to market. And they had varying uh, rates. They were supplying to one customer at a different rate, the other customer at a different rate. One other, uh, you know, one other uh, entrepreneur that I knew uh, had a problem with uh, inconsistent supply. So one month he had X and the other month he had X plus two, then for three months he had nothing. So what we did was, so what me and my partner did was we spoke to all of these people and we said, why don't we have a contract? You produce, we provide you the raw material, the source. And we give you something that's called a catalyzing agent, which is which is the basically the IP, which makes our product different from their product. So we have control over the SOP and the raw material, and we individually put a, our person there at the production levels. So what they got from the deal was they got standardized billing. They knew they'll get paid on time. They knew the rates, and they knew that they had orders every month. And what we got was we were able to scale up within two months, four times our production rate. Because otherwise there was no way. And this was, and we could do this without raising capital, without letting go of our equity, without raising debt. So sometimes you will be faced with this. And if you don't have, if you're not prepared for uh, to be, if you're not prepared for it, scalability will become a big issue. So we have to understand what scalability is. So this is what scalability is. And this is how uh, we tackle the problem of scalability.
right? This is a non-IT situation. So with IT, it gets a little easier. But in with manufacturing, sometimes we obviously got lucky. I will always give luck uh, a lot of credit. But again, we worked and we were, you know, we were, we, we made our own luck, so to speak. Now let's come to, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about, you know, about innovation, what innovation is, how to go about it. So I want to sum up, right? Uh, and this will just take, this is my rule of 10. This is my personal rule of 10. Uh, and I tell this to a lot of people. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, startups I'm mentoring right now uh, through T-Hub, through Lunch Club. I've, I meet a lot of, because I really like people who are in their early 20s, I'm 42, by the way, so I feel ancient when I speak to them, uh, but uh, they're full of uh, energy, vigor, and they have a brilliant idea, but they are blind like a bat. They don't know what to do, right? They they And we all have uh, grown up on stories of success, right? You know, Swiggy Esa Kia, Uber Ye Kia, and this happened and that happened, and everybody is biased at their success stories. But for one successful uh, company, there are about a hundred or a thousand that have failed. So knowing all those people, all the companies that they have failed, how and why they failed is far more important than knowing uh, companies that have succeeded. So when I'm mentoring them, uh, it gives me a huge rush of um, you know enthusiasm and creativity and uh, just you know the amount of passion they bring to the table. So I give them this rule of 10. The first thing is observation, right? Uh, we've spoken about it for ideation and everything. We need to observe uh, and for all of this, I'll give you an example, right? Um, I'm sorry. Can you see that? You I see the iPod? No, I think uh, it's stuck. It's Your presentation is not there. Oh, my God. Can you see now? No, no. I think you, you, you are uh, Mbate energy is, that is showing. Oh, that is showing. Okay. Let me. But anyway, you have spoken all that. Uh, it's clear what you said. I just want to share the last uh, thing. Can you see this? This is okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So the rule of 10, right? Um, keen observation. Um, is, is it okay? Am I running out of time? No, no, no. no, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. So this is iPod, right? So Steve Jobs, um, um, you know, his daughter, Lisa, his daughter, Lisa is listening to Walkman and um, she's frustrated. Uh, and he asks, why are you always on that? And why do you need so many cassettes? And she's like, see, I, I can only listen to 12 tracks at one time. He observed that that was a problem, right? And he said, I'll, uh, he said, uh, in a year or two, I'm going to make sure that you have uh, a piece of equipment in your pocket, which will have 10,000 songs. And uh, iPod was born, right? Um, but iPod is also another example for questioning every, everything. Whenever you are told that this is a problem, yes, but I see he hoga, right? This is what is going to be accepted. And it's, this is what is going to happen. It is, it is accepted. You have to question the status quo. You have to question everything. He did. He, he Steve Jobs again questioned why cannot you put ten thousand songs in it? MP3 players were there, but MP3 players didn't have the ability to put ten thousand songs in your in your back pocket, right? So if he had not questioned the status quo, he would not. We would not. We would still be stuck with Sony's MP3 player, the dingy looking blue ones, right? So thanks to Steve Jobs for questioning everything and the risk appetite. Again. I'm trying to, uh, you know, give you all this some a rule of ten, giving only Steve Jobs and Apple as an example because he pro probably did all of uh, what was required to be a good innovator. That's why he's considered to be. Uh, some people confuse him to be an inventor. He is not an inventor. He's a very good innovator. Um, innovator, uh, part of an innovative team actually. So risk appetite, right? Risk appetite is Sony. You know, they came up with an MP3. They were happy with it. They didn't want to do anything more with it. There are a lot of examples. HMV, right? Did nothing. So they collapsed, right? Xerox did nothing. They made way for Microsoft and Apple. Otherwise, we would never have Apple. They didn't have risk appetite. 
Um, give me one second. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I, I'm, I was getting some calls. So I had to get rid of them. So you have to have the courage to go with your, um, you know, not just gut feeling, but if, if something works for you and if you think that this is wrong and you have done all your other research, you have to follow through because you owe it to yourself and the idea itself. So there's a lot of responsibility for it and you have to go ahead with the courage, um, failing which Sony uh, would happen to you as well. Networking and building associations, right? And this is again, uh, where Pixar comes in, right? Example of Pixar. Now, Steve Jobs, we all know was in Harvard, he dropped out of Harvard, but he had learned calligraphy. And when he went and sat in those calligraphy classes, he met a lot of people he thought were very good at it. And he kept the association on. And when he was kicked out of Apple, he met those people up, they all formed a team and they came up with Pixar. And Pixar was sold to Disney and Steve Jobs remained a billionaire and made more money from his uh, sale of Pixar to Disney than from his Apple stock. So Pixar wouldn't have been born if he had not kept those associations of networking in. This is just one example of networking. We can have a presentation on networking itself. But moving on, keeping it simple, Google, the biggest and the best example, the most uh, complicated uh, search engine in the world, uh, seems so free and so clean, right? Alta Vista and all the things that came, Bing. You look at any of those, Yahoo had a good search engine. Functionally, all of them probably did a very good job initially when they started off. But why do we always go to Google? And now it's synonymous to search engine, but when it came, it wasn't, right? I mean, nothing is famous before it becomes famous, right? So Google, because they kept it simple, even YouTube, right? Um, it's such very... I mean, YouTube, Google, iPad, iPhones, iMac, everything. So keeping it simple is very, very important when it comes to your product or even your service. Uh, find and retail ta talent, right? Um, this again, I'm a very big, big uh, proponent of finding talent and retaining them. Um, <clears throat> I have spoken a lot about it, so I'll not go ahead on that. But this is the most important part of uh, my rule 10. Seeking value and not just money. I always tell people who are young and out there to make a startup, uh, the idea of you know selling it for a million dollars uh, or a billion dollars is there and it probably might get you up from your bed. But if that is the only thing that, uh, which is make, making you get up from your bed and go to the office, then you probably will not get there, right? You have to have the ability to see that you are delivering some value to the society. The process is far more important than the result. And uh, if you look at Google, if you look at YouTube, if you look at Apple, they all they all gave value and because of which they made money. YouTube was about a guy who wanted to post pictures, uh, post videos so all his other friends could see. And he realized he didn't know, he didn't have a situation or an app or a technology to support that. He did that. Right, he made money. Is what the ho gap that was after effect. Google also was about two guys, right, who wanted to have this problem solved, the search engine issue, and they tried their hell to get the money out and get out. Yahoo was told to buy Google for a million dollars, right? Um, but they never thought they'll be one of the richest people on the planet when they started Google. So the idea is you. Do not worry about making money. You worry about delivering value and money will take care of it. Money is a byproduct, not the goal. I can actually do a whole class on it, but I will restrict myself. Uh, perfect your pitch. Pitching is very, very important, right? When you have, you might have the right intention, you have the right product, you have the right team, you have the right environment, you have the money, you have everything. Now you're in front of the customer. How do you tell them that your product is the product they want, right? You have to get your story right. If I go and tell them, please buy my product because it will help you save the earth, it won't work. Yes, it does, right? But the story is of two people who have left everything and are investing in a, in a, situa in a product or a technology that has, uh, you know, uh, 
ulterior advantages apart from just solving that and it also is financially viable this whole package made one of my first customers jindal take it even railways they they bought they didn't buy the product they bought our passion they bought our story they said okay if you have spent and so much and you are confident about this product i'll give you one try because nobody is going to give you a product i mean so nobody is going to give you a sales order they going to give you a chance right and in fact the first time we lost the chance we got a chance a product failed and we could just go back and convince them only because the pitching was right i want to give an example of this particular picture if you see that that's the first ad that um, apple came up with steve jobs was not telling people to buy a very good looking personal computer ibm was making it he could have told them see this is an ugly looking pc look at my macintosh it is a beautiful piece he didn't talk about the product only he told them that you are listening to people telling you what to do break free that is still considered to be the biggest uh, the, the best ad in the history of advertisements in the world and macintosh was born so perfecting your pitch is more important the story the idea the passion that you bring to the product is what is going to be sold to uh, is what is going to be liked by the uh, customer not just the product so remember that please and there's something called the dance of the denial you know tim roman talks about it we all um, you know we all at some point of time we have or you know we have all the resources and tools and we say no 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 this is not right you know i can't be that smart um, to have figured this whole out um with with us it was like are when we started off like why is reliance not into it right why is adani not into it why are the big people not into it we understood that later right i mean there are other issues at it but we also questioned ourselves why us if this technology is so good and there are so many benefits why is everybody not doing it so these this dance of denial will happen to you irrespective of what product it is right so don't get sucked into it work at it go for it and i'm pretty sure if you have done your due diligence and you go about it the right way with professional help and mentoring you will if not succeed greatly you will not fail and this is my personal assurance we are not one of the biggest companies in india right now but we are definitely profitable and i look back for three uh, i look back and see four years of my life uh, i've made enough money but more importantly i'm be i'm here today talking to you only because of that right so that's a huge plus and believe in yourself right uh, i've already spoken about the dance of denial uh, it's a counterpart of belief um, but uh, there is a very famous thing right uh, a share like jab jab ki jab jab kisi pe jag hasa hai tab tab usne itihas likha hai right so you have to believe in yourself there will be a lot of naysayers they'll tell you you can't do it this is a ridiculous idea uh even some very very smart people will tell you uh, right some very very big people have said uh, very stupid things in hindsight so uh, don't take it you understand your product you your passion is more important and all i can tell you is best of luck guys you uh, are all future entrepreneurs and innovators believe and all the other 10 things that i have spoken about will definitely help you get there right you know belief is the leap of faith uh, so that's why i put the picture there sometimes that is all that is required when everything else is done the only difference between you and the other startup is the leap of faith uh, it's a it's a beautiful talk very very uh thought provoking and interesting because the kind of examples uh, the lucidity in which you have mentioned i think uh, uh, it's brilliant and uh, though you. though uh, you know uh, you know I, you you mentioned that i didn't prepare much and uh, i know because the kind of uh, uh, you know busy schedule you had the kind of other problem you had with all yeah. that i think this is a brilliant talk and uh, as uh, uh, my colleague professor prabhakar rao was talking about i think we should plan three of us and uh, i will also uh, 
invite Driti and uh, uh, the others, uh, and then we can make into a, a, a maybe a diploma program, and it will spur a lot of people to get into uh, you know these areas of uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah, you're being very kind, sir. I, I fumbled my way through no, it, no. and uh, it was... I, actually I finished this presentation yesterday at three thirty in the night, no, no, and uh, I got up at six thirty in the no, morning. Can... So I just I got can... two hours of sleep. No, no, I can understand, but it is brilliant. Thank in you, fact, Thank I you. I worked uh, in uh, uh, late eighties with a management consultants in okay. Bangalore. Yeah, I, I because I was in Karnataka for more than sixteen years. Yeah, and uh, in management consultants when I worked, those times in eighties, uh, seventies, and eighties, they used to talk about quality circles. Uh, in the quality circles, they used to give examples of some of the uh, Japanese uh, CEOs, company CEOs. When the product is released, they used to go to market and find out from the customers, why are they not buying this product? Why are they buying the other products? Sir, I'll, I'm trying to contact. Yeah. No, I, I think they came back online. And, uh, uh, you know, these quality circles that we used to talk about. Uh, yes, are, sir. Are the ones uh, management, they uh, used to do it. You know, uh, it is, you can still hold that. And, and uh, uh, the CEOs used to go and inquire about uh, uh, the problems of the products and what are the advantages of the other products and then come yeah. into it and improve the product so that yes. a product is in the uh, forefront. Uh, forefront. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you just. Uh, yeah. So that is. That I would like to. Uh, that is what... Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I thought at the end of the slide, I was going to open it for Q question and answers from all the yeah, others. No, no, if they no, have I any think, questions. Now, 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 I would uh, ask uh, the uh, students to, uh, you know, either ask questions or suggest something or whatever you want to feel. Because this yeah, is, yeah, please do. Uh, please, please. This is an interactive session. And... Uh, All of you put on your cameras wherever possible. Yeah. Because. Hi, uh, Teja. Yeah. You unmute, unmute. You muted, Teja. You unmute. No, oh, I didn't see, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hi, hi. If you want to say something, ask, sir. Please feel free. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I think I think they're taking time to kind of respond. Uh, Nidin, if you allow me, and if others are fine with it, can I ask something? Oh, please, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, I mean, fabulous. I think I was really, uh, you know, really interested in what you're doing because, of course, that's very close to what I am interested in, and these are problems which are, you know, global, and it's not only that it's restricted yes, to, you know, a country because what you're talking about in terms of your own innovation. Uh, but actually, what really caught my mind is that, see, definitely when you source these plastic uh, refuse, because they're like kind yeah. of, uh, you know, used and things like that. Uh, see, traditionally, what has happened is it is associated with particular communities which do this gathering. Yeah. Right? Yes. Primarily, you know, yes. communities which are on the marginalized sections because they are the yes. ones who are, you know, picking up this plastic and then, you know, I mean, what happens to that supply chain I'm not aware. You know, it's like something which is. Uh, so, yeah. As as, uh, can you throw some light on this? Like, you know, who are these people? Who? How do you source that initial raw material, which is a refuse of plastic, and how does it enter your whole production process? So, what is that? Uh, that that process. If you can throw some light on that. Like you know, yeah. Allows... So basically, that is uh, a parallel industry by itself, sir. So when we started. It, uh, we went around the small municipal corporations 
uh, and um, so it's cooperative societies. And we have this very um, altruistic idea that, you know, we'll take these marginalized people. I've been to a lot of slums uh, where they actually segregate plastic from metal wires and everything. Uh, and we saw, sort of thought of this outreach program where we get all that and we do it. But then it turned out to be a, night, a logistic nightmare and the volume itself was not big enough. And then we realized that there is a parallel industry where we have people who do this for a living. Yeah. And they give me, uh, so for example, my, my uh, raw material came primarily from Tourism. These vendors have this whole supply where they collect the plastic, shred it, clean it, shred it, and they deliver it to me in the form I want, right? Uh, because one of the units can take only powder, right? Uh -huh. Which is PP powder only. And one of the units that was built, because now, like I said, we went into contract manufacturing. So it was not built according to my specifications anymore. And now, so I had to work with getting the raw material to match the machinery, the hardware. So there is an industry by itself. It's a very, very small scale cottage industry basically, where they have these people who go collect specific uh, plastic, right? And then they clean, heat it, dry it, uh, shred it, either into powder or granules, and they deliver it to us. For us, logistically, it made a lot of sense. We try to do it uh, on a very, you know, you understand it, altruistic sense, yeah. but it, it doesn't work. I don't want to say this because you are part of the government as well, but a lot of a majority of municipal corporations in India, uh, they think they're sitting on a gold mine and they will not give access to private companies to touch the plastic or the landfills. Uh, it's a oh. very, it's a, it's a big stigma role and it's a big red tape issue and all of that. So there are a lot of individuals who are very uh, conscientious about it and they want to do it. There was a talk of uh, Poonawalas and Thermax uh, yeah. working with uh, Clean Pune. There was a Clean Pune drive. Um, Therma, uh, Maher Jasiya told me, uh, not Maher Jasiya, sorry, Maher Padamji told me, uh, you can be taking care of the plastic part and we'll take of the dry and the wet waste. Uh, but I don't know what happened to that. And frankly, I didn't follow up. Into this. Most of these things don't work immediately, sir. They take ages. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, something has to be done. But, but uh, the, the good part, the silver lining to this is the segregation is happening and it is going. That is for sure. I mean, at least about a decent percentage of that is happening. Nidhil, uh, another question which I had was, uh, can this diesel be used for domestic consumption, not for bikes and this thing? Say for uh, cooking, you know, or for maybe uh, heating water. Can this be no, sir. domestic? No, okay. Uh, one, it is... Uh, yeah, it's a bigger footprint. I mean, gas is obviously much cheaper. Um, you wouldn't want to use this in the first, either way, economically it won't work. Uh, the second thing is, um, it is not as fine as diesel. I mean, when it, if you make it as fine as diesel, we can make it colorless and odorless. It's actually, it will look like water to you, right? Uh, we in fact have to add color to, so that they don't get confused. But then the cost goes up very high. And the reason for this is because we are still buying plastic waste. The day we get subsidies and the waste is supposed to, there are countries in Europe where such uh, like industries like us, we get a tipping fee in return for consuming the waste. Right, right. Here we are buying the waste. Yeah. So there is a huge difference in economics. Forget about subsidies, they don't exist. Uh, yeah, it's a huge, mm -hmm. yeah. On government scale, on uh, public trade, it's a big problem. This, uh, you know, entrepreneurs like me, um, and there are a lot of them. I mean, there are at least fifteen, uh, you know, fifteen good companies in India. Uh, some in north, one in northeast, uh, some in west, uh, and a, a few more in south. Where they were well intentioned, they have the ability, the resources, the money. I'm talking about seriously rich people who wanted to do this because, they, you know, it sounds very cool, you know. So uh, I know two, <laughs> two people who, where the father is funding them because they want, he wants his son to have a cool job. Uh, so we have all of that. But the reason we are not going up to the next level is one of the main reasons um, is also because of lack of infrastructure, policies, procedures, right. 
uh, a very conducive environment to do such business in India. Okay, my last question for I this believe time. the tide will change. Yeah. Right, sure. So I'm like, what is that reasoning behind that the government is not considering subsidy? What is their logic behind? I mean, what is? I'm sure this would have been kind of I, I, discussed. I, no? uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, sir. Um, I we have not even gone there uh, okay. Okay. because uh, I uh, it's my fault because in my mind I'm a private individual who has a private company and um, I didn't want to waste my like I said prioritize I, when I was in the market I was prioritizing my resources if I go fight uh, I, I've, we have, I think we've also written to uh, Nitin Gadkari once. Um, about uh, the GST or something, you know, why are we being taxed at that rate? Uh, just like fuel, this is a, a green fuel. I don't know what happened to that. I'm not even sure if the, he got the letter. I mean, I don't want to blame him. Uh, I thought the idea was to write to him and appeal to him. I don't want to get into politi political incorrectness. But the idea is, uh, I don't really know about the government side, the policy side. I just know that it's not there right now. And for all the product, um, producers, we are all doing our job and it's still an SME business, sir. I mean, they're all looking at a decent margin of profit and wo aa gaya, fir ghar jo, aram se EMI pay ho gaya. Uh, we are doing something and you know, that's it. No, I, I, I you see one thing what happens is a government is like an elephant. Uh, unless yes. you need uh, some kind of pushing, it won't move. Uh, because, yes, yes. Whether it is with policies or anything. I I, yes, I I recall in early 90s, I myself and another colleague of mine, he was a professor of economics. Uh, he was then associate professor. We both uh, went to municipal corporation. And uh, uh, that time, uh, uh, we wanted to do a project on urban, both solid and liquid waste. And on, oh, the solid, yes, yes, okay. huh, on the solid, actually, that was uh, the time when Rachel Chatterjee was the commissioner of. Uh, I knew her earlier because I worked on sericulture, how sericulture uh, products are used as uh, uh, you know entrepreneurial uh, these things products. So I went to her along with my colleague, and she said it is a, a very intelligent, very interesting project. I will support. But I have no funds. I can only recommend your uh, this thing. And uh, this was basically idea was, you see, in all this, as uh, uh, Dr. Alok was talking about, is there is a uh, you know chain, like you know here you have a recycling chain, whether it is a cloth or with the plastics or anything, or even iron or other metals. There are kabaddi walas. They sort out, they sell, and then recycle it. So there is a culture of the whole, uh, you know, process of recycling or waste, throwing the waste. It's a certain waste, for example, we have big dustbins are kept by the municipalities. Except in the dustbin all around, you will yeah. have the waste thrown. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah, happens yeah. is, well, uh, we wanted to observe in a few pockets in Hyderabad, what is the way they dispose of the waste? What is the culture of it? Okay, and okay. how do we use okay. that idea to uh, you know, generate income out of that and generate recycling of materials? So this was what we tried, but then unfortunately my colleague left to Delhi and then I am alone so I couldn't pursue that idea. But this is something I would suggest some of the students to work on that. But this is a an idea, yeah. as you said. You know, observation is an anthropology. We emphasize on observation in parts yes, of observation. Yes. So this is what uh, I, uh, I this is what I uh, uh, feel that you know, because you you have really given interesting ideas. I think students should take it up, and any of them if they want to raise uh, one or two questions, I think we'll do that. Otherwise, uh, you know. Your lunch gets. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, Ryan, are you you want to say something? There's one thing I want to add to the question. Yeah. yeah. Just one thing before you ask me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are also other. Uh, see, this is not the only solution to the plastic waste. 
there yeah. are also other solutions to the plastic waste so i don't want to put the you know the blame game only on the government and policies yeah, yeah. Yeah. and this product also has its inherent issues we it cannot be scalable beyond the limit it's but a natural ceiling there's only okay. so much plastic you can use you can't use all plastics so there okay. are issues but i the, the, for this purpose of this innovation uh, you know seminar or talk the idea is you can take something that is solving a problem and go far with it it might not be all the way but yeah. it will definitely you know we have made a dent yeah i would say a bit about about 100 tankers of fuel 100 tankers of diesel was less consumed because of my company right right and they, see because of that we got you know we made money as well but that is some satisfaction that we'll always have tomorrow after a few years if we shut this company down as well we know that maybe about uh, at least about a million or 2 2 2 million liters of fuel of diesel was never used because we right. came like that imagine all the 25 people in right go right. please you question please yeah anybody want Do you have a question no. no sir i can add one thing i uh, is like uh, is my observation among my, our friend circles so actually what happened what we started doing among our friend circles we collected our way i mean waste bottles and then we collected and we start giving to the uh, other scrap dealers and all we did like that we started already among our group but how to process this for longer we have no idea So when sir was telling about the municipal thing disposal thing i got confused for that side because uh, we don't know how campus is working how i mean i'm observation from back campus many place wherever we go in the campus there are lots of waste suppose near to the horticulture department itself there is lots of waste material so by saying that while we are working in the morning work or something we plan that our uh, among our group that we will um, collect our own waste and we'll give to other people who are using like sustainable all this thing so that we are doing but how far we can do we have no idea so if, if as uh, sir you told about diploma course or something if you give some awareness to the students i think it will be better that we can do something for them sure, sure. I, i think riona this calls for an ethnographic study to wonder what is happening on campus itself yes you know i mean i'm clueless i know there's a dump yard and i know that dump yard gets cleared every month yeah. But what happens where it goes? I have no clue. You know, maybe that requires a kind of study at our own level to see, uh, you know, what really happens, or does the administration know of, or does it give it give importance to waste as such as a material generated by the community on campus? So I think that's a good idea. Maybe we can think of doing some short term study on it. Maybe our department uh, yes, sir, because, uh, uh, yes, sir, because yes, sir, because one thing is when I was observing in front of my hostel, there is a waste place. After this, after yes, some sir. days, their distinct smell comes. So Pore we don't want to even walk outside yes, the hostel. Oh, the And after this, was, uh, after two three yes, days. There are uh, some people waste collector yeah, come and they depose it to the, some other part of the uni okay. campus. Uh, so again, it is affected to the wildlife which uh, happen in our campus. And the people yeah, yeah, who were for work and all that will not be. Yeah. So I was thinking if we can do something yeah. in that matter. Some awareness if from our department or yeah, we'll something do that. from the search. We'll, we'll do that. Good. That gives me an idea. We'll do something on that. Good. I I think I think uh, now now we can. It's a good uh, uh, thing because I know a couple of students used to. uh put boxes in different places i think you are also involved and uh, others were involved i think that's the when way is one is awareness another is after putting that uh after listening to mr nitin i think uh, uh you get an idea how the plastics can be uh, you know sent to somebody who can process it you don't have to sell it you don't have to send it free you can even make little business out of that the waste plastic uh, bottles and all that so we can th that money that is generate can be used for other purposes so think of some of these small projects that's very uh, yeah 
that's very true because we get paid for it as well i mean it's yeah. a business on the side so we get yeah. paid for helping uh, sorting drying right all that. Yeah. yeah in fact that is that is a very uh, that, you see this is our these are the ideas that i think you should find how to uh, you know start small and then think uh, a little later bigger because you can pool money and then do some things right anyway i think uh, uh, is nisha anybody else uh, teja or ganesh i mean uh, yeah. or even sai charan do you have any question otherwise we'll close the session i just i'll i'll just ask for a small clarification am i audible yeah, yeah, yeah. audible yeah yeah i can't see mr nitin so i don't know whether i should put the question or not you put the yeah, question yeah, yeah. no 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 go ahead okay. can you hear me yeah, yeah yeah i can hear you i can hear so the i mean one yeah, question no, no. which i got was yeah yes yeah. okay so one question which i got was when you were talking about this uh, green fuel and all uh, from whatever uh, yeah. little biochemistry that i know when you are actually burning the fu- uh, fuels whatever that waste that you are getting no plastic from plastic and all it will again generate some pollution which will be adding to the uh, what can i say to the atmosphere yeah. rather than a landfill or a water pollution so to me it seems like it's just converting from landfill and water pollution like land and water pollution to air pollution so in what way could it be better i can understand the productivity part that it will ma- make sure that more fuel is not used and all but then what about the negative influences yeah. that's what i am a bit concerned about if you can uh, enlighten me on that then i will be happy Thank- sure. so uh, yeah sure that's a good question uh, and that is ha- that happens with a um, couple of other raw materials like rubber and stuff Uh, around hyderabad there are industries who are using that and that's why there's a lot of pollution and you must have read in paper they they were closed down but with our technology there's no burning see we are doing it in absence of oxygen so there's no fumes so the gases that are produced inside the reactor are condensed so there's um, i don't want to get too technical of it uh, about it but uh, there is a range beyond which you cannot condense that gases to form diesel right the remaining gases are collected in a big gas balloon which is known as gas okay and that gas balloon is powered by uh, and see the plant is powered by a gas generator that uses that gas that was not condensed so there is no exhaust nothing is escaping into the environment if you are burning you're Mm, I think there is network issue room. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. There's a problem with my Wi-Fi. So uh-huh. okay, no, no problem, no problem. So there is because there is no burning, there is no there are no fumes. Um, so you know, yeah. So the reactor is a closed end circuit, right? Uh, so the gases are condensed in uh, you know condensing shaft. and we get diesel from it we get from the reactor within the reactor there is uh, the walls are lined with carbon black because there will be uh, unburned uh, carbon basically right because we are talking about hydrocarbons the unburned carbon escapes as gas or um, it lines the walls so the walls are then um, you know scraped off and that is the carbon black the carbon black is given to the dyeing companies or the road construction guys and the gas is used to power the plant and the remaining condensed fuel which is 70% of the produce even in the worst possible production otherwise it will be 75 to 80% but even if you think everything goes wrong and let's take the worst average at 70% 70% is diesel right or fuel forget about diesel if you if it is not optimal also it is diesel uh, it's fuel uh, and uh, so there is no question of es- it, uh, escaping into the environment that's why plastic uh, this particular thing is not banned uh, but burning rubber we can also get fuel from rubber right um, so there's a lot of talk about that and uh, there are five states in india that have banned the production of fuel from rubber because there this concept doesn't exist you have to exhaust the fumes and then uh, socks and nox are getting in and the industrial areas uh, are getting polluted so to solve one problem we are creating another problem so you that's why i said uh, kudos to you you asked the right question but in this case we have already solved it the technology doesn't allow the problem to happen okay thank you for the clarification cool no problem okay i think we will uh,
close the session. Uh, uh, it is a, a really very good uh, session. I know that uh, you know in a short notice, uh, Mr. Nitin has uh, done a wonderful uh, uh, talk today, and uh, it really is informative and also inspiring. And uh, I am uh, thankful to you for uh, sparing your time. In spite of all your uh, uh, other problems, you could accommodate our time and then uh, give us uh, a brilliant talk. And uh, I'm sure we will definitely uh, have longer collaboration and do some more productive things for a large number of uh, young innovators and entrepreneurs to, from the university and outside also to become uh, a successful entrepreneurs. Because as you mentioned, even failure teaches us a lot of good things because uh, failure doesn't mean we should drop out. Failure yeah. can be a stepping stone for future success. So all these kind of things, I think, uh, uh, will be very useful for people to understand uh, because innovators are always have to be a little more, as you mentioned, they have to be brave and they have to uh, become uh, bold to do things. And that will happen. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. It's an honor to be part of uh, Inotel and University of Hyderabad. My wife was fully, uh, she doesn't think of me as an intellectual now, even though I'm not. She's like, oh, if University of Hyderabad has called you, you must have something in your brain. So, <laughs> We will give you a certificate, you can show it to her. Oh, yes. thank you, sir. I'm sure she'll frame it. <laughs> Just to show it to my son. So, um, thanks a lot. And I hope, uh, I really wish you all the best, guys. Um, you have uh, two good things, I think. One is um, uh, energy, which comes with age. And, um, uh, you know, lack of experience. Uh, I think that is a very, very key point. Because you are not caged in like we are with about 15, 16 years, uh, you become too knowledgeable and too timid to take chances. So go out, take chances, seek professional help, always ask, network, and uh, I wish you all the best in the world. Thank you, Prabhakar sir, uh, Shri Prasad sir, Amul, Alok sir, everybody uh, for including me. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will thank meet you. soon. Thank you. Sure, all sir. All sure. All uh, all so if whatever I can do, uh, I'll definitely be uh, there. Too. Yeah. But short process. Short process. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Thank you all the okay. participants. Sir, can I um, can I get a, a recording, sir? Yeah, I will. I will forward it. I will forward you, you. I will forward also to other participants. Uh, yeah. The all the three sessions that we had on this, uh, the links for sure, that, so that you get uh, so that we can work out based on those things. And if anybody wants to talk to me separately, yeah. half hours now, a year later, yeah. please give them my number. You can reach out to me. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll, I'll, do that. I'll, I'll support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you all. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Amul. Luna, Thank you all. Sajjan, Ganesh, others, Tija. Yeah. Some, some of course, had to you. leave or maybe problems of uh, networking. Yeah. Huh? Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Huh? Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Have you. a nice day. Bye. 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 You stop recording first. Huh? Stop recording. Where is that? Instrument.